So anyway, tonight I have entitled the message Signs in the Heavens, and I told you what we were doing tonight was based upon a prophetic word that I gave at the end of the December 17th message, and I think I even played that, but I'm going to play it again, obviously, to get us right back into the the, uh, context of the thing. But this is what I said on December 17th at the end of the message when we sat down, we're seeking God and what the Lord showed me. The Lord is about to release a sign in the heavens that is going to get our attention. And I believe it has to do with not only validating what I have spoken today, but demonstrating what he is about to do on the earth. And so I'm going to be watching the heavens. I'm going to be looking for things that are surprising astronomers right now because the Lord showed me he's about to release a sign in the heavens and it felt like it was closer rather than far away but we'll see when it comes into being back on there we go um that message the lord said I'm, i i said it pretty clearly you know he's going to release a sign in the heavens and then my application of it was i'm going to be watching the heavens and i'm going to look for the things that are surprising um astronomers you know whatever that would especially get my attention which means when there were thro- three large solar flares on the sun at one time um that was caught my attention because that is kind of an interesting phenomena, but um, it isn't, I don't think that was the sign, because when I saw the sign, I was like, when I figured it out, I was like, wow, okay. Now, it's not going to surprise any astronomers, because it's about the solar eclipse, and, but what it does is an amazing thing. And so first thing I want to do is ground us in Scripture. It's always good to be grounded in Scripture. The Bible says, then God said, let lights appear in the vault of the heavens to divide between the day and between the night. And the li- let the lights be for portents and for appointed times, as well as for days and years. Okay, of course, that's my translation. It's faithful to the Hebrew. So when you see the word Portents. Portents means things that are coming. I could have said omens because omens are things either good or bad. I mean, it point to something happening either good or bad. But after the movie The Omen, all of us think omens bad. So, okay. But it's <laughs> let the lights be for portents and for appointed times as well as for days and years. So days and years is what we talk what divides the timing of everything. And then the portents are times when God wants to show where we are through what's happening in the heavens and the appointed times for things that he wants to happen on the earth. So the last couple of points are about God marking the calendar so that we can live by it. But the first two things are about helping us understand the times and the seasons in which we live. So God said, let the lights appear. He's talking about the stars, the sun, the moon, and all of the celestial phenomena that w- are, is seen in the sky. And so the, let the lights appear in the vault of the heavens. I like that picture. By the way, that's what the Hebrew word means, the vault of the heavens. But most of the translations say expanse. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good translation, too. I just like the vault of the heavens. Uh, have you ever been out? Well, we've. The only time we ever really don't have light pollution is when it there's been a hurricane and the lights go out. And we've been pretty good at stopping those, so we haven't had a lot of lights out. And even when the lights are out near the equator, it isn't nearly as incredible when there's no light pollution when you're up north further, when you're closer to the poles. Because obviously the, the uh, atmosphere is different. And when you look up, it's like you're in the, the vault of the heaven. That's the majesty of it is incredible. And uh, that 
that, that's what I see when I say the vault of the... That's the picture I'm painting in my head by using that word, which is why I like using it. So, But then anyway, we have the portents, the signs, the portents, the whatever, is a sign of what is coming. And um, that is what we're talking about tonight. The portents, the signs of what are coming. Just to give you an idea of what God put in the heavens, there are the constellations. Um, and since Enoch, certainly, men have looked up into the skies and seen what today we call astrological signs. But they back then focused on the story of God. And it told the story of the Lamb. You can buy books on this. Feel free anytime to go out and get Sass's book on the Gospel in the Stars or just put the Gospel in the Stars or Constellations in the Gospel or whatever, and you'll get a bunch of books, including D. James Kennedy did one. I think Dobson even did one, if I recall correctly, but don't quote me on that. Um, anyway, but there's tons of good books out there that will explain to you the meaning of the constellations. And the only one I've I've brought out right now is Virgo, the virgin. And in Revelation 12, she's having a child. She's the what? Oh, the virgin. I wonder who that could represent. Huh. And it says the, the virgin is giving birth to a man child, and then the dragon is positioned to devour the man child as soon as he's born. I wonder what that means, except maybe Herod killing all the babies in Bethlehem. I mean, you understand the, the whole picture, and then he's born into the world and all that happened. But you understand, God set that sign in the heavens, and the only time in history where Virgo is in a position where the constellation or the, the, the sign of the child and the dragon are so positioned, the only time in history that happened was in 3 B.C., September 11th, Rosh Hashanah, which is when you'd expect the Messiah to be born. And so that's the only time in history. It happened once. Huh, isn't that a coincidence? That's why I'll always say to you, when you say, when was Jesus born? Well, it certainly wasn't Christmas. Everyone knows that. Well, when was it? Well, September 11th, 3 B.C., because of those signs. Well, that's, that's the most evidence we've got, in my humble opinion. The Bible doesn't say it. I mean, you know, he was born today, but that sign which God put up into the heavens sure points to it. So, Revelation 12, the, the virgin certainly speaks to us. Um, the appointed times are, are all the things that God's planning on his calendar. And he's put those signs in the heavens for us. And some of the signs are spectacular, like comets and stuff like that. That's really great fun. Uh, let's you know those are those are more of the omens, more of the you know what's going on. Uh, you know when the Haley's comment came by, uh, everyone thought the world was ending. It was that vivid, and you understand it can scare the daylights out of you. I remember the first time I saw the uh, um, night lights the in the sky, which I was in Wisconsin at the time. I was driving home late at night, and th it was that crystal clear atmosphere was over us. I was out in the country, pretty far away from any major city. And all of a sudden, the light turned purple. I mean, the sky. It was waves. Like you see, you know, you see the pictures of what it, the northern lights, right? That happened as far south as I was in Wisconsin. I had never seen them in my life. Like I said, I was driving home at 2 in the morning in the middle of winter. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like I was up a lot at that time of day. And I literally stopped my car and got out and was looking at it. And I was wondering if it was the end of the world. Because it's so something that had never I've never seen it. It was it was like lights of glory coming. When those things happen in the heavens, you start to think spiritual thoughts. Because you think, what does it mean? Okay. And so God that's God's put that stuff up there for a reason. And uh but I remember the beauty of it. It was wonderful. So and of course I've seen now many, many videos of it, you know, from other perspectives, much further north than Wisconsin. I think this year there was a lot of northern lights, wasn't there, coming down into Wisconsin? Did you see them? Did you get up and go out and watch them? Yeah, okay, they're nodding their heads. I'm not jealous at all. Okay, um, <clears throat> so now, the 
Sign in the heavens we're going to talk about now. And I did not know about this because I don't follow that stuff. When I got the word, what the word was doing was, was getting my attention, you understand? To say, look what's coming. When it comes, you're going to see it and understand it's important. So I heard that on April 8th, there's going to be a solar eclipse. I've been calling it, a, last weekend I was calling it a lunar eclipse because that got in my head. It was kind of stuck there. I had to bounce it out. But um, it's an eclipse. Uh, that's just the easy way to say it. A lunar, one, er, a, a lunar one is when the moon is eclipsed. A solar one is when the sun is eclipsed. So it's when the moon gets between the earth and the sun. And boy, is that a picture? Because the moon represents the church. And the sun represents Jesus, and we better never get in the way. Okay? I mean, if you think about it, we better never get in the way. We're supposed to reflect the glory of the sun onto the earth. And we're never supposed to block the glory of the sun. But there's a lot of stuff happening in the church right now that's blocking the glory of the sun. Would you agree? Okay. And so that really does speak. But Okay, but there's a, a solar eclipse coming, and it's on April 8th. And it's going to come across the United States. And it is the, you know, the most recent one before this was seven years ago. You know, when it's a total one like this. And that's the interesting part. But anyway, I have a, a short video of the path this thing takes. Now, the original video, you can find this on YouTube, thegreateclipse.com. You'll see the address on the video. Um, but you can see it coming in off the Gulf of Mexico into, into Mexico and traveling for a bit, but just for the sake of time, I had to shorten it somewhat so we are not staring at a silent video of the eclipse, uh, a, a rendering of what the, where it actually is a shadow on the ground is how they show it, of the, this, what, will, what it will, where it will cover. Let's just put it that way. So let's just, okay, there it is. You can see the shadow of it. Just on the left-hand side, you can see this is where it will be at 1224, 124 our time. Um, it's traveling at 1,500 miles an hour, almost 1,600 miles an hour, and it's 121 miles wide. Now, this, is a, this is a pretty big eclipse. Um, anyway, so I'll start it now, and you can see it moving along the ground. Now, we're coming right into Texas. It goes across Eagle Pass, interestingly. And then the next town that's really uh, of note is Uvalde. That did not make me happy seeing that there because Ovaldi was one of the greatest, most egregious examples of law enforcement not doing their job, and all those children got killed. And that doesn't, I'm, I am so pro-law enforcement, it, it, it really is annoying to see when someone wasn't trained right. So we're coming up through Fort Worth on the left there, and we're going through a bunch of different towns, coming into Oklahoma, Waco. Yeah, he'll be able to see it. He'll be in it right in the middle. Texarkana, it's coming into R, Kansas, Arkansas, Little Rock. Now, here's, here's where it gets really interesting because it starts coming up to uh, um, Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri, Illinois, and its path is crossing. You can see, I mean, look at all those purple lines. That's where all the states are, right? It's kind of hitting them all. But as we're going up, oh, New Madrid is right there. Isn't that interesting? Okay. And you think, oh, that's really fun. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of stuff. I, I saw one video that said it's going to pass over a whole bunch of uh, Salem's, which means peace, and then it's going to pass over. And I'm thinking that, that's, that's a little too deep for me. You know, I, I'm, I, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm not looking for the stuff that is, you know, quite that buried. Because I would think through any swath of the United States, you could pass over a ton of Salem's. Okay. But. What I'm going to show you as we keep on going, this is just, I thought I'd get it right through the United States. It exits by Maine. You can tell on the right-hand corner we're over the United States and Canada right now. Oh, look at that. Linnea's new location. That's going to be chilly. There us we go. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so it's going to go over us we go too. You have to tell her that, Dawn. Okay. And then it's uh, coming back into Maine and then ends. Okay, so that's the, the eclipse that's going to be happening on um, April 8th, and it's an interesting thing because especially when you look at what happened seven years ago, you start to understand there's some unusual things. 
the fact that this eclipse is going to cross the path of the eclipse from seven years ago is significant. Because that means at that intersection, there's already a group of towns and an area of real estate that last year had a total eclipse of the sun. Now, if God puts the signs in the heavens, you got to ask the questions. The question is, when one area of real estate gets covered twice in seven years, and seven years is a biblical cycle, you do get that, gets that same eclipse of the sun, you should probably pay attention to what's going, what's, what's under that patch. Okay, so this is the... Uh, path of the, you can see the the one from 2017 came in over Salem <laughs> okay and then it came across the United States and it went out you know after going by Columbia it went out you know into the Atlantic and uh, but you can see where they crossed right in southern Illinois it looks like Paducah is somewhere around the intersection but there's no way of saying right there what is you know what cities are there so you got to get a little bit of a closer map so you can see new madrid on the bottom of the map you can see the intersection that's that center area you can see where they cross and uh it's there's cairo there i saw one someone trying to say that this is all about an egyptian theme because cairo and there's some other things going on he even started talking about a particular high school again that's too deep for me I'm going, <laughs> if you're going down to a mascot at the high school level, you're really reaching. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. You want to get these big themes. God doesn't hide this stuff. He wants it to be clear. So when you look at something like this, you say, oh, look at that. Kate Gerardo. Yeah, Gerardo. That, I, I, I spelled it wrong. Okay, it's Gerardo. Okay, so, because uh, I typed that in. But. It was there, but you couldn't see it under the yellow. So I brought it out and, of course, misspelt it as I did. But it's Gerardo. It is the hometown of Rush Limbo, for those of you that remember him. And he was obviously a very significant uh, broadcaster in the United States. Um, and it's just a very interesting intersection because that entire intersection is right where the whole New Madrid seismic zone is. Okay, the New Madrid seismic zone. Well, yeah, you can. Those are size. That's the earthquakes that it gets there all the time. It shakes and shakes and shakes. But back in 1811, the New Madrid had an incredible December 16th, and it went on into uh, 1812. An incredible earthquake. They say they it was somewhere between 7.2 and 8.2. Um, on the same day, it had an aftershock of 7. Point, I better look just to make sure I don't misquote four an aftershock of 7.4, and then in January they had another aftershock of 7.4, and in February another aftershock of 7.4. Now you understand, with aftershocks that big, with structures made mostly out of wood back then, or, or you know, whatever, um, everything you were trying to rebuild got knocked down again. It was three months in a row. Boom, boom, boom. Mississippi flowed backwards. There was all sorts of results from that particular earthquake. And uh, a whole bunch of prophetic people have seen the New Madrid popping off. And um, that is something that gets my attention. The New Madrid earthquake zone is in the intersection. And that's been something the Lord's had our eyes on for 20 years speaking to us about it. I, I uh, just pulled up. We, we write down a lot of the prophetic stuff God gives us, and we save it, and we have it in files on our computers, and that way I can put in any topic for the last 15 years and pull up what God's given us on it. And so when I type in New Madrid, it just it, the screen fills up. Um, because there's so much that God's given us on this, and certainly not only us. But there's uh, uh, Cape Girardeau is uh, a pretty significant location. Um, 
well, let me first, before I get to John Paul Jackson, we'll talk about Bob Jones, because he's the one that first taught us. Bob Jones used to teach, and this is significance, this is so important. He used to tell us this all the time. This was We heard this dozens of times he said this publicly and then privately to us, and I would assume it's more than dozens. It's dozens of dozens, it feels like, because he just spoke about it all the time. He said this, if the United States divides Israel, it will be divided. Okay? That was something he was teaching a long time ago. And he said the New Madrid will kick off and divide the United States if we divide Israel. And God has clearly said to not just Bob, many, many people have this same word and noted for prophetic people. Now, John Paul Jackson, who died in 2015, had a prophetic word about the perfect storm. And he talked about all of the things, I think five things that would come into play in the years ahead, which would cause the earth to shake. I mean, the uh, cultures to shake and all sorts of things. And one of the things was an earthquake on the New Madrid centered at Cape Girardeau. That's why you saw New Madrid was south. doesn't matter. The zone goes way north. And he saw Cape Girardeau as the place that would be the epicenter of one of the major earthquakes. Uh, those who have seen this thing prophetically um, and who have talked about it, well, they just compare it to the, the, what happened last time. Um, Bob Jones saw whole towns underwater along the Mississippi. You remember that, when he would say that? Yeah, so... Um, it was, it was, it's not pleasant. So you think, my goodness, we got to pray. We got to stop this. We got to pray for mercy. We got to make, that's why we prayed at the beginning. When I told you about that sacrifice and how we had to cut off the power of that thing, because it can release wrath and wrath can move a nation to do things. And, um, I, I don't want to see that happen, but in his prophecies, his perfect storm prophecies, by the way, you can still find them on the internet. They're worth listening to. He's also got like 44 headlines that God gave him. Some of them, when it's un- interesting because he got them a while ago. Some of them were fulfilled in the last 10 years. And you'll re- when you read them, you go, well, that's what happened. And that's what happened. And that's what happened. I wish I would have found those headlines before COVID. I didn't know exactly what was going on. So, I mean, I pretty much knew exactly what was going on anyway. So, um, in uh, Chris Reed's $50 dream, Chris saw this headline. What the $50 dream was the $50 bill being cut, first of all, a third, then another third, and then another third so that the dollar would lose value in steps. And uh, that's if we, if we, if we uh, lose reserve currency status, we're going to lose at least a third. Okay? So, and they're trying to work hard at that, whether they'll succeed or not. And I mean, I'm not saying our nation, the enemies of our nation, are those who would prefer to have that status themselves. But um, Chris's $50 dream, he saw a bunch of headlines all the way through the dream. And this is one of the headlines. Uh, major earthquake hits the middle of the United States. Well, a major earthquake in the middle of the United States, it doesn't take much to guess. It's the New Madrid. It's right there on the Mississippi or in the Mississippi area. Um, he also uh, represent, rep, referenced Bob Jones' word in the interpretation of it. He said, this is... If we divide Israel, we will be divided. And so for years, we have been praying that the policy of the United States would not pressure Israel into a divided state because that is a problem. Okay, For us, I mean, because God He's very clear, don't do this. Or if you do, there's going to be a consequence. Who wants that consequence? Um, We get, as I said, a lot on the New Madrid, and once Dawn was caught up into a trance, and as she was in the trance, um, then we record those things and then transcribe them. She said, I was at the New Madrid fault. I was on this thing that pulsed like a heart. I was going up and down on it. Then I was by the fault. The Lord said, don't forget, I will be sending an earthquake, but it is intended to restart the heart to clean out the heart of America. I heard you can't pray to stop this. It's already been decided. 
So that's not like a happy bit of news at the end because we usually pray, but you'll notice we don't call you to pray against the numerated fall because when you get a clear directive like that, you're like, okay, Lord, mercy, mercy. That's what you start praying, mercy. Um, but anyway, the good news in that is it's intended to restart the heart, the heartland, okay? It's intended to restart the heart of America to get us back on track. What it means is our heart is stopped, and that's why we see everything that's going on that's going on right now. Our heart is stopped. And so we have, we have this, this problem. Um, this, was a, this was a quote. This next thing is, is Benjamin Netanyahu. I told you that um, all of a sudden he's told, newspaper reporters are saying, what do you think about Biden saying by Monday next week you're going have, to have a ceasefire? And he was surprised. And then this is what he said. Since the beginning of the war, I have been leading a political campaign whose purpose is to curb the pressures intended to end the war before its time. And on the other hand, also to gain support for Israel. So he's working to stop from the pressure to end the war before it's done. By the way, if he ends the war before it's done, he's going to have more civilians in the future with those brutal atrocities. Everyone knows it. He knows it. Everyone knows it. And so he's going to make sure they have a military victory before those things stop. We have significant successes in this area because today the Harvard-Harris survey is published in the United States, which shows that 82% of the American public supports Israel. That's amazing. Okay. Not so much on college campuses, but 82% of Americans. He continued, uh, this gives us two more strengths to continue the campaign until the complete victory. Okay, so he is... Um, saying this is, and this was on 227 he said this, he, he's recognizing that it's important for him to have the support of the United States in order for him to be able to keep his country safe. But the United States is fickle. I, I can tell you what would change one terrorist attack in the United States, not just a gentleman uh, being in front of an embassy setting himself on fire, but one terrorist attack that is said it's because of your support of Israel, and you're going to see people jumping, you know, fleeing and uh, attempting to be able to uh, get things. That's just the way it is. I mean, it's just the way it is. So, um, Back in December, God gave me a clear word that said there was going to be a sign in the heavens that was going to reveal what's coming. And all of a sudden, I start hearing about this earthquake that is revealing what's coming, uh, or this night, the eclipse. But you understand, my mind now is so tightly tied to eclipse earthquake that I'm, you know, I even misspoke right there. Um, it's a warning. It's a warning. It's a clear warning that if the United States moves in a certain way, it's going to hasten the day of this earthquake. The earthquake's going to come, but we can hasten the day of that earthquake by inappropriately responding to Israel. And so God has given us a sure sign in the heavens, something that he put. Uh, you understand that eclipses were planned in eternity, right? You can set your clock by them. They're not a surprise. They understand the formulas that they do to be able to put them all together. And I don't know how far out and how, ba how, far, you know, how far they can go. I suspect as far as they want. But um, because they understand about orbits and all of that stuff and can work it out with the computers that we have today. Uh, remember, that's how they used to trick the, the indigenous peoples. You know, they would know there was an eclipse coming, even back when they were first exploring. And they'd be able to say, there's going to be an e the The great white god is going to demonstrate that he has power by turning your island dark tomorrow. And, yeah, of course, that's a great way to cow the natives. I don't think God was very amused by it. I don't ever think I want to speak in his name and lie to people to manipulate them. That's probably not going to bear a lot of good fruit for your life. But that's what they did. Um, but anyway... This is certainly something that God planned from the foundations of the world. And then he alerted me in December, don't miss this, because the only reason I paid attention to it was because of the word that I had from the Lord. Because I would have just blown by this eclipse. They don't, generally speaking, don't interest me. But this one had some significance to it. 
And so I'm presenting it to you tonight so that you have an opportunity. You know what the time that we're living in. It's, it's time to put on our big boy and big girl shoes and realize the day and age in which we live right now. Some of the things that we've been talking about for 20 or 30 years, sometimes 50 years, we're living in that day. We have been chosen. We have been privileged. The saints down through the ages have looked toward this time with eager expectation, hoping they would be among those who had the opportunity to represent the Lord on the earth in these times. And we're the ones he called. Wow. What an incredible thing. And I, I'm not saying that so that we think, well, wow, that's really cool. And you know, I'm saying it so we realize the responsibility we bear. And we have to be prepared. This is the time. How do you prepare? Get closer to the Lord. I always get closer to the Lord. Check what you can do in your lives to get, to, to get rid of the, the, the clutter so that you can stay focused. And the stuff doesn't distract you and take you in different directions or whatever uh, because we're in some very interesting times. Now, by the way, does this eclipse mean that it's going to happen like right now? No, I said it's a warning. But I think it's a warning because we're about to see some things in the, wor- in the nations turn against Israel. And we have to be able to use our political voice as well as our prayer voice before the Lord to pray that our nation does not go in that direction because if it does well we already know what the lord has said so okay thank you lord for this opportunity this was from you lord we know it and i know it at least and you were making sure that we wouldn't miss it because it's a significant thing and i ask that you would help us to be able to become the people that you've called us to be in this day and age In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.